Oh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whichever is applicable to you. Uh, welcome to uh, our virtual uh, lecture. Today, I would like to uh, start chapter five, uh, introduction to solution in aqueous uh, reaction. I would like to start the chapter by breaking down or defining the two terms uh, used in the title solution and uh, aqueous uh, reaction. To start off with, uh, before we look at part A, part P, and part C of the chapter, our solution is made up of two things, a solute and a solvent. This is the uh, minor uh, component, all right, in a solution, and this is uh major uh component quite often students uh confuse the difference between the three terms solution uh solute and uh solvent does not mean that a uh, solute is always a solid it could be uh, a liquid uh it could be a gas all right it's not always that solute is a solid now, uh, aqueous solution, uh, aqueous, sometimes we, it's the notation, this means uh, aqueous reaction. It's a reaction where uh, it takes place, a reaction which takes place in, uh, takes place in a tool. That means all the uh, reagent are dissolved in liquid A2 aqueous reaction. As a matter of fact, most of the chemical reaction you will encounter in chain chem uh, courses will take place in uh, aqueous phase or where liquid A2 is used as a uh, solvent. So uh, this chapter is broken into uh, three parts. Uh, this is the chapter outline. Please um, take note of how the chapter has been broken down. If you are making your road notes, there is a uh, part A, uh, which will uh, cover 5.1 through 5.4, part P, uh, 5.6, 5.5, and uh, part C, the last section of uh, this chapter, start from 5.7 to uh, 5.9, 5.9. Let's start off with what is uh, molecular uh, gastronomy. The chapter start with the molecular gastronomy and uh, spherification or spherified theory. You know, it just has to do with Cooking, molecular gastronomy is a way of preparing food, it involves chemistry. You can read uh, that in the text. Uh, and a common reaction in this uh, gastronomy is precipitation reaction. When we say precipitation reaction, it's a reaction where when you mix two reagents, a solid is formed. A solid is formed. Generally, precipitation or when a precipitate is formed in a reaction, you can have A uh, in aqueous phase plus reagent B in aqueous phase uh, to form C. And then the subscript here, uh, as indicate a uh, solid, if a solid rain, this is a solid phase, uh, we call this a uh, precipitate, precipitate, okay? A solid is being formed. We call that precipitate, and the process of formation of a solid from our uh, two liquid reagent is called precipitation. Precipitation. So here, in homogeneous reaction, the solid is called a precipitate. Uh, you will see some abbreviated PPT uh, for precipitate reaction. So, chef or whoever prepared the food sometimes. They could use common reaction called precipitation. When they mix two, aqueous solution, a solid is from, we call that a precipitate. Oh, uh, well, uh, sperification is just to encapsulate the liquid part. Okay. Now, uh, just 
5.2, uh, this is the most or uh, the most significant what I want you to uh, make you our own notes. Solution concentration, I defined earlier on what a solution is made up of. It's made up of a solute and a solvent. A solution is a homogeneous mixture. We, we looked at homogeneous, heterogeneous mixture a while back. Uh, but the solution is a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances, and I've broken down the solvent solution was to solvent plus a uh, solute, solvent plus solute. Now, uh, this could be more than uh, two. It's not always that we have two, but the major one here. Major component in a solution is called the solvent. The rest could be solute. You could have four component making up a solution, such as air in the room right now uh, is an homogeneous mixture of uh, more than two gases. A uh, solution can be in gaseous state, it can be in solid state, it can be in a uh, liquid state, such as salt water, such as alloy, probably maybe brass, you may be familiar with that for solid, solid uh, solution. This means the solvent is in solid state, the solute is in solid state. For Cassia solution, that means the solvent and the solute are both in Cassia state, or it could be in liquid state. Alcohol plus H2O, for example, will make up a solution. We call that a uh, liquid, uh, liquid uh, solution. That means the solvent and the solute, right, are in liquid phase. Uh, solid, uh, solid means both they are in solid state or uh, gas, uh, gas uh, solution. So here you need to differentiate solute from the solvent. Major component is the solvent and the solute is the minor uh, component. Throughout the remainder of this chapter, unless other state solution will refer specifically to aqueous solution. And aqueous solution is a solution where H2O has been used as a solvent aqueous solution. So see, uh, NaCl, uh, this means just uh, sodium uh, chloride dissolved in dissolved in H2O, aqueous solution of sodium chloride, we call this aqueous uh, solution. The solution in which we have been used as a solvent is called aqueous uh, solution. Now, when you uh, dissolve a solute in a solvent, the relative amount of solute in a solution is called concentration solution are often described in quantity. And as far as we are concerned, the quantity will be in number of moles. So we can have a concentrated solution, it means we have a high number of uh, moles per given volume of solution. So we talk about daily solution, we have small amount of the uh, so uh, solute compared to uh, solvent. Concentrated solution, on the other hand, have high number of moles of, uh, or amount of solute in a solution. So you can look at this diagram and uh, based on the illustration, this is a concentrated solution compared to uh, solution B or solution in LMA plus number two. Uh, this is dilute using the spheres as the number of or amount of this solute in a solution or in solvent. So relative amount in a solution determine whether the solution is dilute or it is uh, concentrated.
this is another demonstration on concentrated phases dilute. Look at the solution, which is concentrated. We have high number of moles of what? High number of moles of the solute compared to uh, dilute, dilute. We can, uh, because of the solution, which are mixtures, the composition can vary from one another depending on what you have. It can be uh, concentrated, it can be dilute. We quantify the amount of solute relative to uh, the amount of solvent. We call it concentration of uh, solution, which can be used toward molarity. Uh, molarity is a unit of using M, this is used for, uh, this is a unit used by Kevin, sorry about my uh, allergies, that allergies today, but it'll be okay. So this is molarity. It's a unit used by chemists to express the amount of solute molecules or moles, sorry, moles, in volume of solution in liters. Please take note of the volume, not volume of the solvent, but volume of solution in liters. I'll be using this throughout um, this notation, molarity equals to number of moles, all right, number of moles of uh, solute, all right, of uh, volume in liters of uh, solution, volume in liters of solution. It's important to note that uh, the volume of solute, solution, sorry, should be in liters. And remember one liter equals to a thousand ml. You may need this down the line to convert the volume in ml to liters. One liter equals to a thousand ml. Let's look at this equation. You can generate uh, two more equations. Let's call this equation one. I can call this equation one. Here, equation two is, uh, if I rearrange that number of moles, we can use of uh, solute, all right, is given by molarity times volume in liters. Let's call this equation two, so that if you are asked, find the number of moles of solute, you just have to multiply the volume in liters by the molarity. Volume times molarity gives you number of moles. Or uh, volume in liters, let's see, volume in liters of solution is given by number of moles of uh, solute of uh, uh, molarity, molarity of the solution. You'll have to rearrange this equation to determine what you are looking for. So I'll rearrange the equation here to find the number of moles of the solute or number of moles of uh, solution. Just give you uh, three equations you can generate, this is equation one, equation two, equation three, from the molarity equation, from the molarity equation. We look at a couple of examples on how to find the molarity or how the question can be asked on concentration of a uh, solution, concentration of the solution. All right, uh, why do we have to learn about the concentration or molarity? It's because it affects the rate of reaction. It influences the reaction in what? In aqueous uh, solution. You can think of, you know, concentrated solution will uh, proceed faster than, uh, you know, a reaction with concentrated reagent will proceed faster than a reaction with dilute solution, it can affect the rate of uh, reaction. Uh, uh, in the lab, uh, you will prepare at some point, you will prepare a solution of a uh, specific 
concentration. And what you need to understand is that uh, you will have to know the exact volume of your solution using the equation, the molarity. And then, uh, of course, there is no way you can uh, count the number of moles and say one, two, three, or whichever moles you are, uh, you need to dissolve in a specific volume of uh, solution to get yourself the molarity. For example, here, let's see. If you are asked to prepare one liter of zero of one molar NaCl solution, how are you going to proceed using this equation here? Okay. You need to know the number of moles of uh, sodium chloride and then the volume of solution, which will be one liter in this case, one liter. This is the molar mass of sodium chloride. Why do we need that? It's because there is a standalone equation. I need you to remember, which we learned earlier on, that uh, number of moles, which is a uh, standalone equation, it is. It has nothing to do with the molarity. It is given in mass in grams of solute. This is solute of uh, molar molar uh, mass. Sometimes you may be given this molar mass here, such as 58.444 sodium chloride. If you are not given, I recommend that use a uh, periodic table. You need to use the periodic table. Okay, we're gonna use the periodic table, all right? For example, to get 58.44 grams atomic mass of sodium plus atomic mass of chlorine give you that, but if you are to use the periodic table. So with this, you can rearrange, uh, therefore, uh, mass in grams, mass, you need to mass in grams of uh, NaCl for this example is given by, if you rearrange that, it will be the number of moles of uh, NaCl times the molar mass of what? Molar mass of uh, NaCl. This will give you the mass you need to do what? To, uh, to mass out so that you transfer. You see this, you need to weigh out and then dissolve, which means this is the amount of for one mole. So at the outset, if you know the number of moles, of any solid you need to uh, dissolve in a specific volume of solution to get a specific amount or, or concentration of solution, you use this equation. I call this equation four, or maybe I can just circle this. Please remember that uh, it is different. I will not even have that. It is different from equation to here. Here we have molarity and uh, volume. So you have to see which information you are given. This one is used in determining the amount of solute you need to dissolve in a specific volume of solution to get the uh, molarity or concentration of the solution. So we can use a uh, molarity in calculation uh, to find either volume or uh, number of moles we can derive a conversion factor to either find the mass or volume of a solution. These are just numbers uh, you need to remember, okay? Uh, once you know the equation I just highlighted, you can move from moles to mass or uh, mass uh, to moles, mass to moles. Uh, this is an example of uh, using the molarity equation for an aqueous solution. So if you see aqueous solution means uh, liquid water is used to dissolve glucose. This is the chemical formula. And there is a reason why we are given this, so that you determine the molar mass of glucose. The molarity of 2.00 liters, and again, here are three significant figures. See, you are given three significant figures. Why not 2.0? That contains 50 grams of uh, glucose. If you are not given the formula for uh, the solute, you may be given the name. Like, for example, if you suppose you are given only glucose, do you know 
the chemical formula for glucose. You need to find out that. Maybe uh, down the line, you may be given another compound. It's assumed that you have learned, you know, the chemical formulas and the chemical names from chapter three, molecular compounds and ionic compounds and organic compounds. So this is glucose, which six carbons, 12 hydrogen and six oxygen. You can find molar mass for that. This is the mass. We will need this to find the number of moles. We know the volume. The volume of this solution that will contain 0 0.2503 significant figures moles. So if we know the number of moles, we know the volume, proceed from that. So the strategy here is you need to find the number of moles of glucose. You see, number of moles of glucose, this is the molar mass times per mole. 50.0 divided by 180.2, three significant figures because of 50 here. This is the number of moles we have in 50 grams of glucose. Therefore, molarity equals number of moles of volume milliliters, and this is the molarity equation A. And if you know the molarity, volume equals to number of moles of molarity. I gave you that equation, so you need to rearrange the uh, molarity equation to find the volume. And then the number of moles is volume in liters times the molarity. Look at this. We have been given volume in what? Volume in liters. Sometimes you may be given volume in uh, ml. And remember, one liter equals to what? Equals to a thousand. Uh, ml equals to a thousand ml. So we have that we can uh convert the volume from ml to liters using uh dimensional analysis using dimensional analysis. Let's see if we have the equation here. This is the line check. We just get my calculator. Make sure you we are on the right track. So uh. How many grams of uh, how many grams of magnesium uh, nitride, right? How many grams of magnesium nitride do we uh, need for uh, that magnesium nitride? This is MgNO3 magnesium nitrate is present in 145 ml of 0 0.1 molar, molar solution of magnesium nitrate. With this, you need to find the molar mass of uh, molar mass of MgNO3. If you are not given use the periodic table. It's 148.3 grams per uh, mole. This is the molar mass of this compound. It's an ionic compound. Using the atomic, uh, periodic table, molar mass or atomic mass of magnesium, two nitrogens and six oxygens. You add up everything, you the molar mass for that. So what is the mass? So at the outset, we know the volume. Volume in liters is 0 0.145 liters. I have to change the liters because of what? The molarity equation. And then uh, we know molarity is 0 0.15, uh, 0 molar. So what we need to do is we need to find, first of all, the number of moles, which from molarity equals the number of moles of volume in liters of solution. This implies number of moles of MgNO3, there's a subscript here too, is given by the molarity 
than this volume in liters of solution, which is equals to 0 0.145 uh, liters. I had to change that to liters because of the equation here, molarity. You see this? Molarity equals number of moles. And maybe just be specific here. L O three two. Okay. So I change this point one four five times molarity is zero point zero point one five zero uh moles per liter. By the way, M is the same as moles. Per liter. It's the same thing. That's why I'm changing here to moles per liter for easy calculation. Look at the liter and liter will go away. We remain with the number of moles. We remain with the number of moles. I have that this will be 0 0.021 uh, uh, moles of magnesium nitrate, MgNO. Uh, three with the two there. This is the number of moles. That does not answer the question. We use this equation, mass or number of moles. Look at this number of moles of Mg NO3 subscript there given by. the mass in grams of molar, molar what? Molar mass. See, which means mass is given by number of moles times molar mass let me abbreviate that to mm you see molar mass i know the number of moles from this calculation previously here we know the number of moles and we know the molar mass of this i just calculated that that is 148.43 so that when we plug in here now it's going to be 0.0, uh, 0 2, 1, 7, 5, uh moles times molar mass is 148.3 grams per mole. So that unit cancellation, mole and mole will go away and you remain with uh, 3.1 uh, grams of mg or uh, NO like that two that's good two that is the uh grams of magnesium nitrate present in 0 0.15 uh, molar solution the volume of 145 you can um practice with problem number 21 23, 27, 29, 31, and the three on page 206. Uh, just like I said before, math is something you need to practice. So practice with this problem and you will be okay in the exam, in quizzes, and even the uh, Alex problem. All right. So uh, this is just an uh, example on uh, molarity. There is another equation uh, we use to determine the molarity of solution. We call it dilution law, all right? Dilution law or equation. And it is of this type, M1, V1 equals to M2, uh, V2. Or on the PowerPoint slide here, it is written MC for concentrated, all right? This is MZ, uh, MZ 
V Z equals to M dilute and uh, volume uh, dilute. This is D by the way, subscript D. This is subscript D. So this is a concentrated, concentrated, dilute, dilute. It means the same thing, or you can use M1, V1, M2, V2, whichever way is applicable to you. If you're using ML, it's just gonna be millimoles. You don't need to change the volume to uh, liters. You, so long as you maintain liters, liters is the same thing. You, so long as you say ML, ML is gonna be the same thing. Out of the uh, four identities, you see one, uh, two, uh, three, and four. If you are given three, you should be able to calculate the fourth one. For example, uh, let's say molarity one should be M2 of V2 of uh, V1. This is equation one. M2 equals to M1 V1 over V2. Equation two or V1 equals to M2 V2 over M1. Equation three, lastly, equation two, M1 V1 over M2. So these are the four equations you can generate from the main equation M1, or you can use MC, MC, VC for concentrated. I like to use M1, V1. So uh, you have to use critical thinking uh, to figure it out which one is your M1. For example, if the uh, volume is increase from 35 to 50, that means you are starting with 35, which is your V1, and 50 is your V2, or what is the final volume? That means V2 is what you are looking for. If you are starting with here, uh, you have to assign, you have to write down, tag the M1, M2, V1, V2 on the numbers on the problem, and use critical thinking so that you know which one is your M1, V1. With practice, you'll get to know. This equation is used uh, whenever you want to bring a concentrated solution to a less concentrated solution, which you may need in your lab, all right? This is what happened behind the scene in the uh, prep room, in the lab, uh, concentrated HCl. Uh, we use that as M1. We want to make 0 0.1 molar HCl. That will be M2. Figure it out with what's the volume of the concentrated, which is V1, and the final volume V2 for the dilute solution. Uh, in serial dilution, you'll see this in molarity and dilution in the lab experiment. I believe um, Chen came on towards the middle of the semester perform experiment on serial dilution. And serial dilution is taking a concentrated solution, bringing it down to a less concentrated. Here is an example of how serial dilution is formed. So initially, if you take a concentrated solution, let's say 10 ml of concentrated in a 100 volumetric flask, this is volumetric flask, and there is a calibration mark by the way along the next, you can see from here, there's something like a line, there's something like a line, this is not liquid, but uh, you will take 10 ml into 10 ml volumetric flask with a calibration mark along the neck so that you dilute with deionized water without overshooting. Assuming that the meniscus is just right there, you cannot overshoot. And then you take 10 ml into uh, volumetric flask number two, dilute into that, and then you take it to the room here. You don't go back to the stock solution. Let's call this a stock solution right here. You don't go back and put 10 here. You take 10, take 10, take 10, and you see the concentration is decreasing for every uh, dilution. We call this serial dilution. You will see this is an experiment, and it's good to know what serial dilution is all about. Now, uh, here is an example on, uh, on dilution law. 
what volume of 12.0, again, 12.0, three significant figures, a common laboratory stock solution must be prepared, must be used to prepare 2.50 ml of 0.125 molar. So if you look at these two, this is V2, this is M2, this is M1. Remember M stands for molarity. This is V1, what volume? This is V1. So you need to tag down so that you know. If you look at this problem, it has nothing to do with using the molar mass or number of moles of volume, but we are using the dilution law. Use common sense, use critical thinking to figure it out that this is a dilution law problem so that you plug in your equation and just uh, find M or uh, V1. So if I am to do that, V1 uh, in concentrated, this is MLC1, this is ML of concentrated. I'll just use V1 for three significant figures. It's pretty straightforward, just practice with that and uh, you can go on. Let's see, uh, learning check, how many milliliters of stock solution, all right? We need to find out the milliliters of stock solution here. So uh, here is how many milliliters, stock solution, that means concentrated. The right equation we're gonna use here is this right here. This is our equation we need to use because we are looking for V1, so solution is V1. Uh, M1 is 6.0 molar nitric acid. You have to prepare 110 ml of 0 0.500 molar nitric acid. So uh, our M2 is 0 0.500 molar, or I can just write here that uh, V, one equals to M2, V2 over M1, which is equals to M2 is molarity 2500 molar times V2 is 110 ml over M2. This is M1, sorry, 6.0 molar. Look at unit calculation, the volume will be in uh, ml, the volume will be in ml. If you count the numbers down there, uh, the volume of the acid will be 9.1, if I'm not wrong, 9.16667, uh, uh, two significant figures is 9.2 uh, ml. This is how much you need of the stock solution, of the stock solution. So. Uh, look at problem number 35, number 39 in, uh, in the lab manual, but not lab manual, but in the text, 35, 36, 328, for more practice on dilution load. These are just an example on using M1, V1, find the number of moles, starting with, look at this, starting with 2.00 molar stock solution of hydrochloric acid force, standard solution, that is solution one, solution two, solution three, all the way to four are prepared by sequential. This is serial dilution. Taking 10 ml, and by the way, 10.00, uh, that is precise volume delivered by the volumetric flask, volumetric flask. All right, in uh, each, 250 volumetric flask. This is pipette, volumetric pipette. This is volumetric flask. Determine a concentration of the four solution. Uh, be the number of more. So we will use dilute, determine the concentration of all four. That means you are diluting a concentrated M. Two, this is dilute, is uh, M1, V1 over two. To get the number of moles, we use the total volume in 
data in leader or in uh, ml it's the same thing you can use ml you can use leaders to get that and this is how it look like for the uh molarity for solution one solution two solution three remember we are taking 10 ml so this will change sequentially you take this will be your m1 in the next solution two this will be your m2 three and so forth so you'll die and you should remember how to form for that this is the number of months for each uh solution for each solution now uh, let's shift gears to stoichiometry stoichiometry you know quantitative relationship of ions in a solution for example sodium sulfate dissolved in h2o will produce two sodium ions. Just interpreting what a subscript means, this means we have sodium, two sodium ions and uh, one sulfate ion when it ionized. Again, uh, remember the polyatomic ion, you cannot split sulfur and oxygen. Polyatomic ion, when it ionizes and dissolves, it gives us two ions, which is polyatomic ion sulfate and sodium ion therefore if a solution has 0. Uh, if a solution of 0. 0.35 molar sodium sulfate you look at the ratio that means you multiply by two to get the concentration of uh, sodium and by the way we can use parentheses you'll see later on that the concentration of uh look at this sodium is twice because we have two so it's going to be 0 0.70 molar and a positive concentration for uh sulfate ion is going to be the same thing zero point because it is one molar and no sulfate is it so for or uh, two sulfate so sulfate ion this is sodium ion solution so given the uh concentration of solution you should use the stoichiometry to figure it out how many uh, ions of each are present in a solution you see parentheses this means concentration means concentration so we can use bracket uh, here is a uh, example on uh, solution stoichiometric the chloride ion using square bracket notation express the concentration of chloride ion in. So if I look at this, it will be three times the concentration of the solution. For chloride, it will be 3.06 to multiply by three, because we have three chlorines. Uh, for nitrate here, nitrate ion NO3, if this is the concentration, you multiply by three here, so it's gonna be 0 0.902, 0 0.9, 902 molar for nitrate and uh sodium you want to, uh you need to find look at this this is slightly different how are you going to do this sodium ion is equal to what is the concentration if sodium is so if the concentration of sodium which is twice that means the concentration of the solution will be half whatever we have here, okay, which is 0 0.62, 0 0.62. That's how you uh, determine the concentration of uh, ion. This is A, it's B, and uh, that's C. And by the way, there is a zero here uh, for three significant figures, three significant figures. Well, you can look at more problem uh, end of chapter, all right, to find the concentration end of chapter. Problem number 26 on page 206, there's a problem on solutions to geometry. But before we proceed, let's see the um, learning check problem on solutions to geometry. What is the molarity of nitrate? We are looking at the nitrate. So A... Uh, because we have one-to-one -one ratio here, 
uh, I'll say concentration of nitrate ion in this case is 0 0.225 uh, molar. 0 0.22, all right, 0 0.225 molar. For uh, concentration of nitrate in 0 0.225 molar, all right, uh, magnesium nitrate, you will have to multiply by to the concentration of uh, the concentration of the solution. Okay. So for B, this will be concentration of nitrate and not three, negative will be 0 0.225 times two, because we have two, this will be 0 0.90, uh, four. You multiply by two that. What is the value for that? I have my calculator. This is point what? Uh, uh, point uh, two two five times two. So that will be zero point what zero point four five this is zero point four five so five zero more uh c the nitrate ion uh zero point what zero point two two five Times uh T shall be three by the way. The T shall be three. Please change that to three. So we will multiply that by three. 0 0.675. The aluminum here should be three. Please take note of that. Aluminum nitrate. So here are the uh this is molarity, molarity. Uh, solution stoichiometry, solution stoichiometry. Look at problem number 26. Problem number 26. Uh, solution stoichiometry 5.3. Uh, in aqueous reaction, we can use the volume concentration of the reactant and product to calculate the amount in moles. We can use that. And um, the balanced equation. We then use a stoichiometric coefficient. What do we mean by stoichiometric coefficient? Uh, these are the coefficient in the balanced equation to convert from reactant to more uh, to number of moles of the uh, product. It's just a simple roadmap moving. We are comparing the number of moles of the reagent with the number of moles of the product uh, based on what you are given in solution, volume of reagent A that will produce, uh, you know, using the moles of B volume stoichiometry, we can use that to determine the volume or the number of moles of the product. It's just a simple roadmap. Please learn how to use uh, molar mass, mass of substance A to get moles of substance B, each depending on where you are going to move from molarity to mass of A, look at the green or mass of A to molarity of B and vice versa, solution stoichiometry. Uh, let's see how many grams of sodium hydroxide, again, NaO4, I, Crumbs are needed to neutralize 20.0 molar, no, 20.0 ml of 0 0.150 molar. This should be molar sulfuric acid. Remember, we talk about the coefficient. Stoichiometric coefficient. 
we learn earlier on how to balance the equation, you should be able to balance the equation. So what you need to do here is, first of all, you need to balance the equation. Complete neutralization, that means NaOH hydroxide aqueous plus, all right, sulfuric acid H2SO4, and in acid base neutralization, uh, a salt is formed sodium sulfate SO4 uh, plus uh, liquid H2 or liquid H2 or acid base neutralization. This is not balanced. We need to balance the equation. Look at the product side. We have uh, what? Two sodium. We have one sodium. So the coefficient we need, let's start with this two there. We need a one there and a one there. We say it under two here. We need a two there. So that four hydrogens on the product side, four hydrogen on the reactant side. So what we know here is we have 20, no, 20, 20, zero ml and 0 0.150 0 mol. Uh, what we know on sodium hydroxide is we want to know how many what grams. for complete neutralization. Remember, molar mass for this is, you can use the periodic table, 997 grams per mole. In order to find the number of moles, we start with what we know. So volume of sulfuric acid chain that the liters it will be zero. This is how you set it up, solution. Solution for that is uh, 0 0.020 liters times uh, 0 0.150 uh, moles per liter times the mole ratio, what I'm doing here is to find the number of moles of, I'm using the information, the molarity for sulfuric acid. This is sulfuric acid and the volume here, this setup right here gives me the volume, number of moles of sulfuric acid, which I need to use the mole ratio to find out the moles of what? Sodium hydroxide. So from the balanced equation, you'll see that, or you take note that uh, for every two moles of NaOH, consume, all right, one mole of sulfuric acid, SO4, is consumed. The mole ratio is one to one. Remember here, moles of uh, sulfuric acid, so moles and moles will co, liters and liters will co. And then the last one here, up to that point, you should have the moles of uh, sodium hydroxide times the molar mass, 39.99, uh, seven grams, one mole of an AOH will go away, and you should have 0 0.24 uh, zero grams of an AOH. We have used solution stoichiometry, how much of this will react, and plug it in the equation. Plug it in the equation. The key thing is make always. Always make sure that you balance the equation. Balance the equation. Uh, acid paste titration. Before we uh, look at the titration technique, an acid and a paste react to form a salt and a water. Acid paste neutralization, sometimes acid paste neutralization is used. Uh, titration is a technique used uh, to determine the concentration of an analyte. Uh, 
uh, you will see, or you may have done this in the lab using a curate, calibrated from 0, 0.00 to somewhere here, 50.00 ml. Uh, if you fill up this, that is the meniscus at the 0, 0, you are 50 ml off. What cause in the curate is called the titran. You are titrating, titran. And what you have in the flask here, you are analyzing, we call this analyze. And uh, adding an indicator here, indicator is just an organic molecule which changes color. So if we add small amount of you are tightened from the puree into the reaction flask here, you don't see any color change. But when there is stoichiometric amount of titran and the analyte in the solution here, any additional of the titran will react with an indicator and you'll see a physical change in the appearance of your analyte. At that point, we say that you are an equivalent point in titration, equivalent equal. That is a point in titration where there is equal amount of analyte and titrant in your reaction flask. Quite often, our equivalent point is indicated by an indicator. An indicator is basically an organic molecule which changes color depending on the acidity or basicity of the solution. You will see this, please remember, uh, you'll see when you perform the hydration, you'll see a physical or physical color change, either from colorless to pink, all right, depending on the concentration. So uh, a common here, common indicator is phenolphthalein, which is colorless in acid, but uh, in basic solution, it is pink, which signifies the equivalent point, equivalent point. Uh, just to look at what happened at the molecular level, uh, this is an acid, and there is an indicator in this that is colorless before even we add what? Any base. So if you continue adding base in the solution, okay, it will react with an acid, and at equivalent point, you will notice a physical change in your solution from colorless to pink, which means you have equal amount of moles of hydroxide and uh, acid. That's what happened in acid phase uh, titration. This is a common indicator, phenolphthalein, which is colorless in acidic, but uh, it's turned pink in basic solution, in basic solution, which is used to indicate the equivalent point equivalent point. Uh, a conception question, 5.9 is in the text, a 10.0 ml sample of 0 0.20 molar hydropromide solution is titrated with 0 0.10 molar sodium hydroxide. What volume of NaOH is required to read the equivalent point, to read the equivalent. This is titration. You need to write the balanced equation, okay? Let's see how you will proceed with this. I know you may have figured it out the answer already, but let's see. APR is titrated with NaOH. This is an acid. And this is a paste, NaCr plus H2, acid phase neutralization always produce liquid H2. Uh, the equation is one to one, uh, to one to one. When the mole ratio is one to one to one, you can use M1V1 so that uh, here, for HDR, M1 is 0 0.20 molar. V1 is 10.0 ml. 
what volume? So V2 is question mark, M2 is 0 0.10 molar. Remember M1, V1 equals to M2, uh, V2. So if we are looking, this applies for one to one to one ratio. If not, then you have to find the number of moles related to that. Then you factor in the coefficient in the balanced equation. But for now, we're just gonna find V2 is equals M1, V1 over M2, which is equal to what? This is equals to M1 is 0 0.20 molar and V1 is 10.0 ml over M2 is 0 0.10 uh, molar, which will give you uh, 20.0 ml. So this is a titration and remember I had to balance the equation. They will not tell you that uh, balance the equation, but remember to do it. To balance the equation and proceed with the calculation. Uh, look at problem number 65 uh, on page 208. It's a good practice on solution stoichiometry. Uh, well, this is just a roadmap on you know, how you can navigate titration problems. You can move from volume to molarity, uh, using the mole ratio. All right, use the coefficient in the balanced equation moles of the solute to find the concentration of your analyte. Find concentration of your analyte. All right, uh, I explained that what the equivalent point is. Uh, the titration, another problem. This is a good practice. The titration of 15.0 molar HBR solution of unknown concentration requires 18.44 ml of uh, 0 0.100 molar sodium or potassium hydroxide solution to reach equivalent point that will for complete neutralization. What is the concentration of the uh, unknown HPR? So if you are doing HPR aqueous plus uh, KOH, that is potassium hydroxide, it will form a salt, potassium bromide plus liquid H2O. That is liquid H2O, liquid so how do we calculate this? Is the equation balance? Yes, the equation is one to one to one to one. Mole ratio is one to one. So you can use uh, this uh, M1 V1 uh, equals M2 V2. Let's take the condition for hydrogen bromide to be uh, uh, M1, which is what we are looking. What is the concentration of the unknown HPR? Concentration means M, uh, M1, V1, we know uh, this is M, V2. For potassium hydroxide, 0 0.10, 0 molar, and this is 18.44 ml, 18.44 ml, all right? And we know M V1 is 15. This is V1 there is 15.15 ml, 15.00 ml. So if we are looking for M1 for hydrogen bromides, take M2 V2 over V1. Yes, 18.44 ml times uh, 0 0.100 molar over V1, which is 15. 
which is 15. So I'm just going to have that for molarity uh, one, molarity one. So if we have that, uh, that means we're going to have what? The molarity for potassium hydroxide. This is 0 0.123 uh, molar uh, HPR. Just rearranging that. Remember, for one to one to one, otherwise you have to write for each one of them and then you use that equation to know how many moles you have, the molarity. Remember always volume has to be uh, either ML or code for M1, V1, M1, V1, M2, V2, M2, V2. All right, enough on our titration. Please uh, practice more on titration. Let's go to section 5.4. This is the last uh, part in part A, the last section in part A. Part A covers 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, and 5.4 types of aqueous solution and solubility. Let's consider two types of solution here. The one uh, solution made by or prepared by dissolving sodium chloride and a solution prepared by dissolving sugar or sucrose or glucose. All right, in this case, sugar. Both of them, they uh, form homogeneous solution. But those are two types of solution. We'll see what happened at the molecular level. And we'll start off with, at the molecular level, we need to understand, first of all, the uh, molecular structure of the solvent. Solvent, in this case, for both of them is H2O, which is the solvent. So there are two types of forces. There is solute-solute force, and then there is the solvent-solvent force. That means there is force of attraction between solute molecules or particles, and then the solvent. So for solution to form, for solution to form, the force of attraction between solute and solvent should be so strong compared to solute, solute, and solvent, solvent force of attraction. The solute solvent force of interaction should override the force of attraction between the solute particles and a uh, solvent uh, molecule. So if you look at uh, the type of forces, T should be strong. Solute solvent or solvent solute interaction should be so strong so that what? For the solution to form. Other than that, solution will not form if solute solute interaction is so strong that there will be no attraction. So we should have this to be the strongest for the solute to happen. But before that, understand the molecular geometry of H2O, that uh, it is a polar molecule. What does polar mean? It has a partially uh, charged portion of the molecule that is positive and what a negative. If you look at the color coding, this kind of like dark, this is red, uh, chemistry use electrostatic potential map to show which, re which region of the molecule is high or has high electron density. Negative portion of the molecule indicates that uh, there is high electron density on oxygen, whereas the hydrogen we have here, this is electron poor region of the molecules. We say the molecule is polar. It's important in the solution formation. So pay in mind that uh, when sodium chloride, for example, is dissolved, all right, the orientation, how sodium will be attached to other molecule when it dissolves is it will get attached to oxygen. 
Whereas the negatively charged will be attracted towards the positively charged portion of the molecule. This is what happen when you dissolve a uh, table salt. However, uh, for molecular compounds, which you will see, look at briefly, is slightly different from what we just looked at. This is what happens when sodium chloride is dissolved or generally ionic compounds. Remember, ionic compound is solid, or oh, yeah. uh, a compound formed when a metal reacts with a non metal. My ionic compound, and generally, ionic compounds which are soluble, this is what happens. The water molecules surround the cation, positively charged. And uh, water molecules around, but the orientation is different. You see negative portion of the molecules around that, negative surround in the same way. Uh, it's important to know uh, that uh, the process by which solvent particles surround the solid particles, we call it solvation. Solvation is a process by which Solvent molecules surround what surround the solute particles, and then hydration. If you're using this uh, hydration, if H2O is the solvent used to dissolve this solute, we talk about hydration, it's a process by which water molecule in hydration, water molecules surround the solute particles in solvation, solvent. We don't specify the Solvent, we say solvation, but here hydration is when using liquid H2O. Uh, dissolving sugar, it doesn't uh, produce ions, all right? It doesn't produce ions, they dissolve as uh, molecules, which leads us to uh, new terms here. You need to differentiate between the two electrolyte and non electrolyte. Electrolytes are ionic compounds which, when Dissolved in H2O, they conduct electricity, they generate or they generate ions which are transferred from positive and negative, therefore uh, conducting electricity. Now, an electrolyte generally they do not ionize, they do not form ions, they don't conduct electricity. You need to know that. And there are now uh, strong electrolytes, weak electrolytes. You will see that in a moment. So remember when you form a solution, all right, some substances dissolve to form a solution which conduct electricity. They contain ions. We call those electrolytes and we have strong, we have weak. Substances such as sugar or sucrose dissolve to form a solution with no ions. Therefore, they do not do it. They do not conduct electricity, you see? They do not conduct electricity, but for table so conduct electricity. Electrolyze, non-electrolyze. Now, uh, these uh, ionic compounds, this is how strong electrolytes behave when dissolved in A2O, non-electrolyze, all right? They do not conduct electricity. Uh, acids which are not ionic compounds, can also act as electrolytes. Except for acids, which ionizes, weak acid, strong acid, they also conduct electricity, but most molecular compounds, molecular compounds here, they are non-metals, do not conduct electricity, we call those non-electrolytes. So uh, weak acid, weak electrolyte, strong acid, strong electrolytes. So what do we mean by strong and weak electrolytes? Strong electrolytes are substances that dissolve completely, they ionize. Examples are ionic compounds and strong acid. We'll see later on what constitutes a strong acid. Please hold on to that, or you can go ahead and just learn the Strength of an acid. No examples in Gen Chem 2. Down the line, you'll be expected to remember. I'll show you down the line those, but remember strong acids. 
a strong electoral line, and you should know what are those assets. Solution are good conductors of electricity. So we're talking about strong electrolytes where weak electrolytes are substances, you know, they do not ionize completely. Their electric bulb, it was electric circuit, will be dim. They, are not, they don't conduct electricity. So acids are molecular compounds that form ions. So they are strong uh, electrolytes, they ionize. That's what I wanted to mention here. Whereas weak acids are weak electrolytes. So you know you need to know that strong acids are strong electrolytes. They conduct electricity, just like ionic compound. Weak acids, such as hydrofluoric acid, you should know which one they are. A common one in weak acid, you'll see in chain chem, which is, is hydrofluoric acid. Hydrochloric acid is a strong acid. Uh, acetic acid is a uh, weak acid. So look at the weak acid first as a strong. This is a dim, it's, it's conduct electricity, but dim compared to that, whereas non-electrolytes, the non-electrolytes, they, um, they don't conduct electricity. No, which aqueous solution conduct electricity? This one, you know, it has nothing to do with the concentration. It has nothing to do with the concentration, but uh, you need to be able to classify a compound as ionic compound, molecular compound. Remember molecular compound, these are acid. None of these are acid. This is an alcohol. This is an alcohol, methanol. All right, this is uh, sucrose. Sugar, and this is ionic compound. This is ionic compound, and we expect A. Look at problem number 47 on page 206 for more practice on strong electrolyte with electrolytes. You'll see that in the uh, in the quiz and exam, strong electrolyte with electrolyte. Let's look at the solubility of ionic compounds. Uh, when an ionic compound dissolves in water, the resulting solution contain, uh, contains not the intercompound ionics, but some they dissolve. However, not all ionic compounds dissolve. For example, silver uh, chloride is insoluble, whereas sodium chloride is soluble. In general, compound a compound is time soluble if it dissolves in H2, insoluble if it does not. Silver nitrate is soluble, whereas silver chloride is not. You see, this does not dissolve. Solubility. So, how do you know which one will dissolve? You need to memorize because that's where we are heading next is how do we figure it out that this compound is soluble, this compound is insoluble? All right, how do you know? How do you predict? Uh, there are about 10 rules you need to learn uh, on predicting whether a compound is soluble or insoluble. You know, you have to learn, you have to memorize. It's just like learning the... Um, element on the periodic table, you have to learn, you have to memorize until you commit to your memory. Likewise, uh, there are some guidelines on determining whether a compound is soluble or insoluble, which I want you to learn, all right? That is solubility rules. It's in the lab manual, it's right here, that you need to know uh, which compounds are soluble, which one are insoluble. So anything, for example, anything with lithium, sodium, potassium, sodium ion, they are soluble. So lithium chloride is soluble, sodium chloride is soluble, ammonium chloride is soluble. But uh, for nitrate, it's, none of it is exception. The exceptions come right here when you get to halogens and sulfate. So, uh, well, uh, trying to memorize all these solubility rules might take a toll on you, all right? You see that? 
I will show you the shortest, the easiest way of figuring whether a compound is soluble or insoluble. It does not work all the time, but for most part, it works. Let's look at what is on the screen first. The presence of one of the following ions with, within a compound indicates that the compound is soluble with no exception. So the, it's an assumption that you have learned the rules here, the guidelines, and if you look at the uh, sod uh, nitrate here, NO3 is obstructive, none, it's no exception. So all are uh, soluble. So NO3, uh, I mean negative is the only ion which is soluble with no exception. And it's in the compound. Look at problem 49, page 207, um, the solubility. Now, uh, before uh, I wrap up the, the five part A to be continued, this is uh, what I want you to, we will come back to this again.